Welcome to the first panel discussion. I'm your MC, Monica. We are delighted to have a few guests joining us in the upcoming panel discussion. The topic of the discussion is from ban aid to sustainable transformation. We have invited experts from several universities in Hong Kong to join us today. May we kindly remind all of you to submit any questions you have to the Q&A box in Zoom or use the raise hand function during the Q&A section. Let us introduce the panel chair and speakers. Sitting in the panel are Professor Paul Lam, the panel chair from the Center for Learning Enhancement and Research of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Dr. Anna Kuang, president of the Higher Education Research and Development Society of Australasia, Hong Kong branch. Dr. Kevin Chen, from the Department of Applied Social Sciences of the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Dr. Susan Bridges from the Center for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning of the University of Hong Kong. Dr. Theresa Kwong from the Center for Holistic Teaching and Learning of Hong Kong Baptist University. Dr. Kang Chong from the Teaching and Learning Center of Lingnan University. Dr. Beatrice Chu from the Center for Education Innovation of the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Dr. Russia Wong from the Office of the Chef Information of the City University of Hong Kong. Panel speakers will each share their views, which is later followed by an open for discussion. discussion. So let's not wait any longer. Professor Paul Lam, please. So uh, hi, everyone. Uh, in this panel discussion, as mentioned, we are so privileged and honored to be able to gather uh, so many education experts from our many sister institutions in Hong Kong. Um, the arrangement is only possible because of the kind support of an organization called HESA Hong Kong, uh, which is a long established uh, society with the purpose of uh, connecting uh, te teaching and learning practitioners across uh, Hong Kong universities. The theme today uh, is uh, very much related to all the changes we have been doing because of the uh, COVID-19. Um, and in this panel sessions, we will hear a lot of stories uh, from each of the different universities, uh, which uh, is in itself is very exciting. Uh, they are not only to talk about what they did, how they survived, but they also talk about how they turn the crisis into new opportunities. That's it, that is turn the band aids into uh, some solutions that can be long-term, uh, that can be the new normal. Um, and I would like uh, to uh, mention a few more uh, words about um, uh, the following arrangements. Uh, we will have uh, Dr. Anna Kwan, uh, she will introduce HESA Hong Kong a bit more, followed by uh, Dr. Kevin Chen, who will talk about the infrastructure. Uh, that, yes, it is amazing. Uh, they are so well organized. They, each of them talks about different aspects of the band aid or new solutions. Uh, Professor Chen will talk about infrastructure. Dr. Susan Bridges will look at the professional development uh, Dr. Theresa Kwong will look at mixed mode, the new uh, mode. Uh, Dr. King Chong will uh, talk about software and tools. Uh, Dr. Beatrice Chu uh, talk about virtual lab and uh, um, remote learning. Uh, Dr. Kwasha Wong will talk about online assessment. So I'm, uh, without further delay, I give the time uh, to Anna. So I uh, really look forward to a very fruitful discussion today. Thank you very much. Hi. Hi. Uh, 
I'm Anna. Um, actually, I would like to uh, to to say that um, Hersa Hong Kong feels so privileged um, to be invited by the e Learning Forum Asia 2020 uh, and Professor Paul. Well, maybe Anna, um, uh, is the uh, screen sharing working now? Uh, yes. I, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah, looking yes. At, okay. Sorry for that. Okay. So. So we are so privileged to join you in this discussion panel. Let me introduce briefly to you about HERSA Hong Kong. Uh, HERSA uh, Hong Kong Band was established in 1997 as a local chapter of uh, HERSA. HERSA stands for Higher Education Research and Development Society um, of Australis, of, Australia, of, of, sorry, of Australia, of of Australia, Australasia, of Australasia. I'm, I'm very sorry about it. Uh, and um, HERSA is a scholarly society based in Australia for people committed to the advancement of higher and tertiary education. And HERSA Hong Kong uh, works closely with local universities to share best practices and exchange ideas on topics of strategic importance to the local uh, education and beyond. Next slide. So since um, 2017, uh, HERSA Hong Kong has been focusing on uh, a particular project called Redesigning Student Learning Experience in Higher Education Project. So we collaborate with local university to invite students to conduct evidence-based projects to inform us their needs, uh, ideas, and views on optimal arrangement of university education process. Uh, now we have already 20 student teams. Uh, they have shared their views and ideas for improving local higher education um, in the RSLE IHE symposium in uh, 2017 and 2019, and also in application with uh, international audience. Next slide. So these two photos are taken uh, in in the um, first and second uh, project um, symposium. So uh, if you would like to understand um, our most recent development and activities, you are most welcome to look at their, our website. So now may I invite uh, Dr. Kevin Chen to share with you on infrastructure for online teaching and learning. Thank you, Anna. And I hope uh, everything is going smooth on your side as well. If I'm lucky enough, you will be uh, reading into a PowerPoint slide that I'm sharing. And uh, I was told by the host that I would better wrap this up in three minutes. So let's see what I can do. The new normal is here and it's inevitable for us to uh, embrace all the challenges and the changes when we are running education in a new era with the pandemic. And um, to move towards or leap into sustainable transformation we first may need to look at the infrastructure first. So how big is the problem? I believe uh, there's no escape by every one of us on the entire world because the new normal is driven by necessity. Here we're looking at 1.4 billion schools being closed down during the pandemic. And now we have been forced into going into the new normal, whether we like it or not. Yes, we have to upset that. But somehow I would like to dwell on for a few seconds right here to take a look at the chart. You see uh, Hong Kong is in the middle, actually on the lower part of this graph. And this graph actually uh, tries to uh, rank different uh, cities and, and countries on how 
well they are going to rely on online learning and how much they would like to stick around with traditional face-to-face -face learning. And we can see that in Hong Kong, we are actually in the bottom half of these places and uh, the intention to stay mostly in person actually is on the high side. So on one hand, we are being pushed forward by the pandemic into going uh, forward to have infrastructures that feed the new normal. On the other hand, we are still lingering with the old normal as much as we, we want to. So here are some of the uh, major challenges uh, that comes to our mind when planning for infrastructures for the new normal. Should we be sunsetting traditional campus and moving forward to more distributed campus? Do we aim for unified or diverse solutions? And do we adopt a top-down or, or bottom-up approach in soliciting needs and planning our investments? So most of the infrastructures we have right now in university are geared towards traditional face-to-face -face classes. So investing otherwise in online learning or blended learning means we are taking resources away from those traditional investments. So we have to strike a very good balance between uh, moving online while maintaining some high quality face-to-face -face facilities. Another common problem uh, that encounter in the planning for infrastructure is the decision that is uh, pedagogical as well as financial to maintain a unified single solution or go for very diverse solutions. Take this example of lecture delivery solutions as, ex as an example. Uh, some institutions might opt for using one solution while others might cater to the needs of learners and teachers and aim for various multiple solutions, but that has pedagogical and financial implication. And another key um, difference in the planning for infrastructure has to do with whether we are adopting a top-down approach in traditional or conventional way of budgeting university expenses and investment, usually we start with very year marked uh, compartmentalized items that we need to fill with uh, classroom infrastructures uh, on the LMS, on the IT. But in the new normal, we are being forced to think upside down or bottom up to start with what the learners actually need in their distributed campus environment and how, uh, what are the exact needs in their online learning needs and how to blend that into the existing face-to-face -face activities if they are allowed. So I'll leave you with some uh, links to uh, possible inspirations when you're considering uh, how to plan and build infrastructures at your institutions preparing for the new normal. I guess I'm on time, right? So maybe pass the time to Susan. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks, um, Kevin, for pointing out that we have um, to think not only about the, the when of teaching and learning, but the where of teaching and learning. Um, thank you, Anna, for um, Heard to Hong Kong's invitation. Uh, great to see this community sustained for such a long period under your leadership. And thanks to CUHK for organising. So, yes, I took up the directorship we were talking about before. I took up the directorship on July 1 this year. So it was an interesting time to take a leadership role in teaching and learning in the institution. And my colleagues have been fabulous. So I've seen us take... Um, a move from the emergency remote pivot. Uh, we've had that lovely paper, award-winning paper now by Hodges et al 2020, um, saying that emergency remote teaching is different to online learning and drawing some nice definitional distinctions for us. Um, and we um, see this notion of planning forwards uh, into a hybrid, but what that looks like and the shape and feel of it is very different um, according to a whole set of various needs. But for my group, we took a really strong focus on course redesign. So uh, we have a technology enhanced learning um, 
initiative group who do lots of work on tools and how to create a video and how to annotate, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of terrific how-to supports, but I felt that in summer, we really needed to focus on course redesign, but we also needed in this professional development space to focus on our colleagues and to support our colleagues in all of the different challenges they were facing. So we still wanted to think about constructive alignment, but in an online space. And we wanted to build and funnel the best resources for just in time need, um, but central to my research and my own um, belief is a, is a strong focus on dialogue and how we learn through dialogue. So um, first of all, one of the big initiatives that was launched before I even took up directorship, um, Dr. Cecilia Chan, my associate director um, in, um, in professional development and innovation, Cecilia started this series of Education 4.0. That was critical to us in giving us a really great our opportunity to look at the international landscape, also to learn from specialists in online learning. As Kevin pointed out, Hong Kong, and particularly Hong Kong U, have been predominantly on-campus providers. And so we heard from people with much more experience than us in online learning. I had been lucky in that I'd actually delivered one of the handful of online courses myself for the Faculty of Medicine in a professional development certificate. So that was the first time I'd done an asynchronous online. So we were all pretty new to this and we all had a lot of learning to do. So Cecilia set this in motion and this was a constant thread that ran over 10 sessions. And it was wonderful because our president got um, engaged with this as well. The final session with him um, ended up with a thousand participants. You have really strong registrations today. So we're all very much a hot topic at the moment. Um, so while I was taking up directorship and looking for guidance, um, I came across this lovely uh, piece that had was published in August, actually. Um, and we'd already put a lot of our professional development in motion, but it helped reinforce what I intuitively felt we needed to do. And um, one of these things uh, they call CTL, so our Centres for Teaching and Learning, um, some surprisingly good results when they empowered faculty members to accomplish the design and development of their courses more independently. So, you know, our, our um, the support system that we were put in place that I quickly showed you was really trying to do that, empower colleagues to, in all of this kind of um, uncertain period, to feel that they had control over something. And a course coordinator has control over their course, but let's help them shape it the best they can. So this was um, a Canadian study of about uh, 73 institutions globally. So they were distilling some of the best. So what I decided to do with my colleagues um, straight away when I took up appointment was that we would do something like I called a summer sandbox series. So we've got right into this terminology. It really resonated with colleagues and even a conversation with Pro Vice Chancellor and a planning group this morning, they said, oh, the sandbox idea really captured imagination. So um, we put a lot of thought into the graphics. You might remember Hong Kong used butterfly in transformation in 2012 curriculum reform. Um, the idea of a sandbox being a playful and creative space and, and so not a top-down directive, but let's give people room. And so we're moving to um, our, we've done one, summer sandbox and we're moving to a winter sandbox. So the summer sandbox you can see from this from this array, I thought hard about what I was seeing um, uh, were the potentials in online uh, course designs that we could be uh, perhaps taking, not just surviving, but transforming as the theme and take ourselves a step forward. So we built on the notions of backward design, my own work with um, problem-based inquiry learning, case-based learning, also thinking very much about collaboration and engagement, but from a macro course design level, and then um, universal uh, design for learning as a structure for, um, for colleagues to think about designing their course. So our format there was each of these were only 20 minute presentations, so two hour block, four two hour blocks over two weeks in the summer, Colleagues signed up for the whole block and colleagues then stayed on in breakout rooms that were discipline based. One of my staff was a moderator and we have a faculty liaison. Plus we had from our HEA fellows, a discipline based HEA fellow, 
as a co-moderator. And then we also had one learning technology specialist from Tele. So we had this notion of a community of learners with expertise, and we would throw to each other um, various solutions and challenges, et cetera. But colleagues were asked to bring their course design. So I, I moderated the health um, clinical disciplines. Colleagues would bring a course design, their, their current course design and say, okay, I'm going to turn this online for next semester. How am I going to do this? And we would all join and empower that, that person as they made these decisions. And so um, Cecilia and the team are running forward. I'm going to step in and moderate again on the health professions um, group. But we've got um, a slightly different focus and bringing in um, more expertise, both within the centre with Tracy and Don, but also for um, our HEA fellow, Dr. Janet Chan, an award-winning um, teacher, and also Professor Nancy Law, um, with whom I've been collaborating, many of you know Nancy, um, across the years uh, working in technology. Uh, but Nancy's particular interest at the moment is course design uh, as well. So that's been a really um, helpful addition to our repertoire. So that's coming up soon. So one thing that was happening as we were designing the, the summer sandbox was that all of us, as, as we said, we were, when we were neophytes, we hadn't designed, I was the only one in the whole group who'd ever delivered an online course. And so we were really searching for resources and it was so rich as we were debating which ones were good, which ones to include. And I said, okay, we need to create a resource page. And that was another finding here, that one of the key things was sharing of resources. And so that's what we ended up doing. So after the series, we actually curated all the videos, we created tips, pages and guides in a course planner. And um, in two and a half months, we had 56,000 hits on that, on that site alone. And 16,000 were internal, 40,000 external. And our, our, our centre site in the same period had 1.5 million hits. I mean, it's amazing time for, um, for our centres. So that's um, some thoughts from me and um, uh, I hope uh, to continue conversations with colleagues as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, my turn. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, showing okay. up very well. Okay, thank you. Um, Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, actually, uh, I'm talking about Mixmo. I totally agree with uh, Kevin to talk about uh, infrastructure, and I totally agree with Susan to talk about uh, the importance of like conversation and dialogue. Because, like particularly uh, to during uh, any change or transformation, we have to have dialogue. Um, to talk about the Mixmo, uh, I have to first of all briefly talk about the hardware and software. When we talk about mixed mode, that means we are talking about the on-campus face-to-face and the online teaching conducted simultaneously, that is synchronous. Um, and we have, like at HKBU, we indeed like uh, have make sure that everything is ready uh, for mixed mode teaching and learning. So uh, I guess the other university is the same. We have all our classroom have the monitor, monitor built in webcam and touch screen as well. And then of course, uh, the classroom uh, microphones have uh, like an audio is routed, uh, actually connected to the computer so that it would be easier for the teachers and students to hear one another uh, better uh, to avoid any echoing, okay? And also we have everything, all the conference tools that is like, for example, Zoom and Webex, like uh, upload, I mean, um, uh, like installed in our uh, classroom computers. And we also upgrade our learning management system that is the Moodle uh, with uh, Zoom and Webex, uh, Cisco Webex plug in. And also we also make use a uh, future learn platform for the small private online courses and massive open online courses. And as well as we make, uh, make available VPN for all students, uh, particularly those students who are in mainland. And when we have these uh, things settled, then we found it like the online merge offline learning can be, 
can be easily done. Like the teachers, like in the classroom with some students joining like in person in the physical classroom and with some students like joining like online virtually. And then they can see at the same time, seeing the teachers what she is uh, teaching like PowerPoint sharing as well as um, uh, the um, whiteboard as well. But it is not enough. We have to make sure that the students also bring along, even like during the, uh, those who will join in class or join online, they have to bring a second mobile device or smart device to join interactive activities. This actually brings us to, um, to say something that we emphasize, uh, we actually found that um, the, um, this kind of mixed mode learning indeed promotes regionalized and internationalized learning, particularly when online face-to-face co-teaching and learning uh, happens with renowned international scholars and students joined uh, at other uh, institutions just like here, we make, can make a virtual exchange and internship this is a, like an international scholar with a, a colleague, like a teacher, like teaching in the classroom with some students like joining in class and some students joining uh, uh, online as well. And we also find that uh, we can promote remote collaborations in cross-cultural, cross-disciplinary teams to solve global uh, complex uh, issues. This is something that we, we can see and will continue to do because of the mixed mode uh, learning and teaching. In addition to that, we found that like at least we make sure that every uh, class has to be interactive. Like through the uh, online Zoom, uh, the teacher can, very basic one, can use um, uh, the nonverbal functions within the conferencing tool. And also for the in-class participants, we can just ask the students to raise their hand to answer the questions or to just give a vote. For a more advanced version uh, for interactive activities, many of our teachers started using like different e-learning tools like uh, Kahoot, like Padlet, like Miro, Mentimeter Quadric, and Google Docs. Like they do a lot of collaborative learning uh, during uh, the mixed mode learning and teaching. And that's the reason why I think this is important for the future, like uh, to engage and uh, students in an immersive, to provide them an, in an immersive learning experiences using AR, VR, actually we are doing now. And then in the future, artificial intelligence as well as personalized learning. And it is also important to think about the transformation of, of assessment to synergize uh, the formative and summative assessment, particularly an emphasis on the student uh, learning process, assessing the student's learning process and make use of learning analytics to support student learning and rethink the integrity and ethics and the code of behavior due to the change of mode of delivery and assessment. And that's all my sharing. Thank you very much. Okay, and thank you very much, Teresa. I'm King Chong from Lingnan University. So I share my view and observation about Lingnan's uh, adoption of online teaching learning under this very uh, 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 a normal uh, pandemic environment with particular attention to the e-tools and the software. Okay, and in, in short, actually, the, in terms of the developing and advancing the technology and has learning, e-learning and blend learning, actually, Current, the current pandemic environment actually play the facilitating role or even promoting role for Lingnan to accelerate the speed in adopting the, the technology enhanced learning. So let me share with you. Yeah, so we all know Lingnan, uh, Lingnan is a liberal arts college and the liberal arts college have a tradition of emphasizing on the face-to-face -face teaching and a close faculty and student relationship. So there is a lot of room in promoting technology and has a learning. And our university is constantly and consciously doing so. Okay, so that's the situation uh, until June uh, 2019. That means before Lingnan adopt the new strategy plan and before the social incidents starting from November 2019 and also before the pandemic, we can see Lingnan actually 
adopt a lot of innovative teaching and learning incorporating a technology, including big data. Some teachers use the big data to teach economic courses. Uh, we have a long history of using ePortfolio, and we also adopt the classroom response system in terms of uh, you reply, Kahoo, and our, our teacher in language teaching adopt the multimedia e-learning resources, and our business communities also develop the online uh, university industrial industry collaborative platform. And we also, our translation department adopt the computer-aided translation software, and we also have some web geographical information system. So that's up to the, the situation 2019. This only up to the uh, only limit to, uh, to the TDG project. That means only limit to the small number of our faculty member. That means who are quite passion, passionate to innovative teaching and learning. Okay, and uh, now in 2019, June, Lingna has implemented the new strategic plan. One strategic initiative is to develop smart teaching and learning and other cutting edge uh, pedagogies with the help of new digital uh, technologies. How can we do? So our study has approved a, a, a implementation proposal and then require each course by the end of this triennium. That means by the end of June, 2022, each course should incorporate at least one e-learning component. And then we also hope some courses don't we, don't, we are not ambitious. We hope some courses can achieve the frontier level. So we have some, uh, with benchmarking with our, to our sister institution, we set some, some level. The level can be updated and changed and uh, uh, developed according to the new development. There are three levels. One is fundamental level. That means we, need, we encourage our, our faculty member to adopt the technology, e-learning technologies to motivate and engage the student learning, not just a replacement. I mean, according to the SASRMR model, the first level is a, uh, first level is the replacement, and that's the first level. And the second level is advanced level. We hope they can adopt the learning analytics to analyze student learning characteristics and to to contribute to the development and teaching learning method and the curriculum design. And the last level, we hope a smaller number of courses can achieve the. Uh, frontier level. That means we can achieve the internationalization of the curriculum and, and as, as, as associated teaching learning and also integration of campus space and experiential learning and also involvement of employer and the community partner in the learning process. That's a three level. Okay, so uh, it, as I said in, at the beginning, adoption of online real-time teaching learning and hybrid mode actually accelerates the full adoption of technology enhanced learning because teachers have no choice. So they have to use the, the online mode and the hybrid mode, okay? And uh, so that's the situation until the last term, then turn to 2019 and 20. So at that situation, we adopt this E2, including the leap uh, lecture, so very common, Zoom, BBB, uh, uh, Big Blue Mountain, Skype, and uh, Microsoft Team. And we also use the lecture capturing and the panel and uh, uh, under the some online uh, uh, LMS, so our students can adopt the uh, online uh, collaborative learning by using the Moodle and the Google Classroom. And we also use, our teacher use a lot of e-resources in the E2, in, in the YouTube. And uh, if, uh, when, uh, when the, uh, in, during the off-campus time, uh, our teacher closely interacts with the students by using WhatsApp, WeChat, and Facebook. Okay, that's so we also issue various guides uh, for teacher and for students. For example, the, uh, the guide for e-learning, the guide for virtual classroom, and the guide for assessment, okay? So that's the situation until the last term. Now we're under the new normal. We need to think further and refer further and to go further. So the one way, so I think the, in terms of how to motivate and engage our students, we have to align the E2 with our teaching and learning purposes and the pedagogic a purpose, okay? And very commonly, we use the SAML model because they adopt the different E2 at a different level of learning outcome. And we also benchmark with our sister institution adopting liberal arts college, uh, sister institution in liberal arts college. They also encourage their faculty member to, to use, to take reference to the Broom's digital taxonomy when they use different E2, okay? Uh, aligning to their teaching and learning purposes. So our situation is that now, based on the experience of last term, uh, 
when we are under the new normal. So we are, our colleagues are now trying to align different E2 and software with different pedagogy purpose. Here is, is, is an initial shape. For example, our uh, faculty member in arts and in visual studies, they would like to design their own courses, their own online courses. We'll make some instructional design software av available like, um, uh, like, uh, like Articulate and uh, like the, the Adobe uh, Captivate. And we also adopt, uh, encourage our students to use the self-learning like different e-learning resources and the PowerPoint with narrations. And of course, we uh, uh, live a delivery with different uh, online platform. And in terms of engagement and motivation, we uh, encourage them to use different classroom response system like Kahoot, like Learning and Catalytics, Mentimeter, Pool Everywhere, and also some serious education games. And we also encourage students to establish different online learning communities, like a different uh, chat room, so-called, and also the, 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 the discussion forum and the uh, learning management system. And we also encourage our faculty member and the teacher to use different online co collaborative learning platform like Google Suite, like Padlet, like uh, Interactive Whiteboard. And the most important thing is that the refreshing and creation and showcase software are very important for our students to develop high order thinking skill like Bro, like OneNote, like Mind, uh, Mind Mac, Google Sites, Sway, uh, WordPress, students can use such platform and uh, uh, website creation software to, to showcase their own achievement. Of course, we need to collect the student feedback like the SurveyMonkey, Quartrix, and Google Form. So that's the, so our experience is that how to align different E2 and software with different pedagogy purpose. For example, our teacher always asks us, if you, if the university encourage us to adopt e-learning, what guideline can you give me to encourage me, to guide me, use different tools aligned to my teaching purpose. So I'm, we are moving towards these directions. So that's all my presentation and sharing. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Dr. Beatrice Chu from all the right. USD. Thank you, let me share my slide. Right, thank you. So um, I think what I will focus to talk about now is more in terms of uh, remote hands-on experience because uh, I'm from the Sci uh, University of Science and Technology and science and engineering are our key discipline here. So I think when we move online, starting from the pandemic, it's the it's actually limited the possibility for students to come back to use the lab facilities, but a lot of these lab requirements are still required. So I'm going to share with you a few of the things that we tried out at HKUSD. Uh, it's not all, but I think it's something that we can think about whether it's possible to sustain the practice in a post-pandemic time. Um, so for what we did, uh, we, we I'll call it more emergency lab-based practice, practical experiment that we adopt in the past two uh, semester. So the first one that some of the faculty did, or the university actually encouraged uh, in fall, uh, sorry, in springtime, so is the video-based lab class. So video-based meaning that um, the whole laboratory sessions will be video captured. Uh, it will be conducted by either the faculty members, the instructor, or the technicians. So they will go through the whole process step by step of the real lab and then share with the students so students can actually watch it and then they can visualize uh, how the experiment is carried out. And then after that, they can start to answer some uh, inquiry questions that students need to, uh, uh, um, after they watch the video, they will answer. So that's the first type. So it's more video-based laboratory. Um, and the other type that some of our faculty uh, tried out here is they do the real-time online laboratory classes. Uh, there are actually mainly two types. One is more on the real-time demonstration. So it's a real-time online student get to the Zoom class. And then in the laboratory, the technicians will actually run the uh, demonstration. A lot of time for this type of lab is basically I. Um, it's mainly the wet lab. Wet lab meaning lab, uh, uh, chemistry, life science, ocean science. So this type of lab they might use real time demonstration to show students how to go through the real uh, procedures. Okay. 
And the other type is the real time hands on practice. So instead of uh, demonstrating, students really work on it. Okay, so the student really work on it remotely. Um, so I'm going to show you two examples of the real time hands on practice. So the first one they say uh, from uh, electronics uh, um, engineering course is called Introduction to Embedded System. So it's a large class, it's got 120 students enrolled to it, and every week they have a laboratory class. So what happened was, so the instructor will uh, pack all the components for the experiment. So the experiment kit, it will parcel deliver to the student home, no matter they're local or non -local, um, while either they're in Hong Kong or they're overseas, will send it to the student before the semester begins or before the class begins. And the uh, student got the kit. And then during the laboratory class, so every week they will join a Zoom class and the Zoom class student will be break out into uh, breakout rooms. And in each breakout room, there will be six students there, around six students there. Uh, so they work on the experiment and will be guided by uh, a graduate teaching assistant. So the teaching assistant will be assigned to each of the breakout room to facilitate the learning process. Okay. So the class, as I said, is under 20 students. So the, 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 the lab class actually break out into three different sessions, okay? So in each session, 40 students, and then they will break up into different breakout rooms. And then around six T GTAs will, will help in facilitate the student learning. So this is how it, it was done. And the outcome is student actually, the learning experience from the student is equal. So it's equal to what they did in a real face-to-face -face class. So the second example that we did is, uh, I call it maker space to maker at home. Uh, so we have an engineering course. Every first year student from the engineering school, they need to take this cornerstone engineering design project course. So it used to be, uh, there's a maker space uh, here at USD. Uh, so students will work on this design process in the maker space. But before that, the course design is already blended learning. So students need to assess a, a some, we call it micro, uh, online module, okay? So it's uh, in those modules, students will acquire some basic skills, technology skills um, that they require. So like mechanics, programming, uh, how to do uh, electronics and better system and things like that. So they watch all this video first and then they will do the design design course. Okay, and the, they are going, I mean, they need to work on some open-ended design problem. So how this was done, this was done during the pandemic. So you can see that yes, there's a comparison between the regular offering and the during the pandemic time. Uh, it's the same, oh sorry, the same that uh, the parcel delivery of the kit was sent to the students. So the student will work at home. Um, in other than the basic electronic part, so student will student are required to build a air car. So they actually use a propeller to, to drive a car. Um, and they can use some recycle household item to for the for the for the project materials, and then they go through the same process. Uh, during the class time, they will join, they will work together with the TAs. They also break into smaller group breakout rooms. Uh, they will do online prototyping, sharing, and then they also for students that can that got internet connections problem, they can send a video submissions for the work as well. Okay. So I just quickly want run through this. So these are the components sent to the students before class start. These are the prototyping demonstration that they did capture in Zoom. And then this is some of the student work that submit some submission work. So you can see that they use straw wooden stick to build the, the actual body of the of this air car. Right, now, so this is some of the de demonstration that I show you or example that I show you. So looking forward, okay, any sustainable practice that we can bring forward based on this remote lab. So I think for the real-time online lab, um, students are more prepared for class. The reason is because the kids already sent to the students, so they already have all those things on hand. Previously, when they go to the lab class, they will go to the lab class and then the kid will show to them and then they, it is the first time they actually handle it. So the observation is students are more prepared for class before the lab class. They're better engaged because it's smaller group, six students per group in the breakout room. Uh, it's actually more personalized. So uh, in the breakout room, 
if they do find still some students are lagged behind, they will put them in a special room as well, a special breakout room, such that more um, facilitations or guidance can give to the students. So it's even more personalized in the real lab. Uh, for the TAs, it uh, used to be they only work in one session. Now every week they need to do three times. So it's, and because we put the TAs in a breakout room with small smaller student group, so we observe that it's actually be better facilitation skills. So the TAs can develop a lot more uh, facilitation chances for them to build up the facilitation skills. Uh, it's also potential to scale up because of the lab space. Uh, a lot of time, I think for us, in particular, this large engineering or foundation course, uh, with a large number of students, there are limitations in terms of lab space and facilities. Okay, so there's this potential. Uh, in terms of video-based lab that I mentioned before, previously it was quite ad hoc, uh, ad hoc design, so it's just video capture. So I think in the longer term, it's actually got the potential to put more instructionally designed, more well designed in terms of this uh, video-based lab. Um, can incorporate some interactive activities in it and also provide immediate feedback to students when students watch these uh, videos. And something that, something that uh, we are working on now, uh, we have a lot of faculty trying to do now, is actually do some re re virtual lab. Virtual lab meaning either they, they develop simulations uh, of the um, lab projects, as well as uh, some of them starting to work on some immersive experience using AR, VR, mixed reality. I think a lot of people have been working on it already uh, and gamified it. But I think for the lab, virtual lab, uh, it actually takes time to develop. Um, it's quite high course as well. And when you develop it, it might not be able to change it. Uh, so I think when people think about remote lab, I think using more innovative ways such that students can actually work on it, uh, maybe more practical in, in the longer term. Okay, so that's my sharing. Thank you, Beatrice. Um, I hope colleagues are seeing my PowerPoint here. Yeah, I believe so. Okay, so it's crucial on here. Uh, my topic is solar assessment, but in fact, I'm talking about exam arrangements here. So it's a much smaller topic. And it's more or less about my frustration um, day after day uh, in my work. Uh, some of my observations here under the pandemic, um, most of the exams are remaining here. What I mean is, it's the exam. It's not replaced by something else. Um, so we try to let students to attempt exams online or at their own home. So um, one thing is try to convert closed book exams to open book ones. But at the same time, we try to increase the difficulty or the quantity of questions. So kind of make it, um, more difficult in a sense, okay. Um, of course, at the same time, we avoid tree cheating through uh, invigilation online. So um, probably at your university, um, you see on one side, you have Blackboard, Canvas, or Moodle. On the other side, uh, for invigilation, you have Zoom or Respondents Monitor or Proctorio or anything similar to that. So we rely on technical solutions very heavily. Um, and I believe many colleagues encounter technical difficulty and we simply cannot help the students at the right time. Um, and also there's many, many investigation afterward. We need to check what exactly were um, those students doing at whatever time, where they did it, uh, what are the IPs, that kind of things. Not very interesting. I, I do have some suggest improvement to, to do, but of course that's not easy. It, it would be easy for me to speak it out, but definitely not easy to implement. Um, for example, can we increase the weight of continuous assessment? Can we adopt alternative assessments, not the typical exams? Um, can we focus more on higher level learning outcomes? Um, not exactly asking students to repeat something in the exam. So cheating doesn't seem to be more that effective if you need to 
really use your brain to construct something um, instead of just find some answer on the internet. How about more project-based uh, assessment? Let students to co-design what question they want to uh, uh, answer. Not only you give him a or her a question to answer, like a typical exam. Um, also assess them authentically. So, so students need to perform something, uh, not only writing an essay or uh, um, answering some question in the exam, but they really need to perform, construct, create something new. Uh, of course, we want to take advantage of IT solutions, but we want to make it flexible. Um, not that, oh, the, the solution break down now, we can't assess you, so we, we have a makeup exam, not that kind of things. Uh, and also, we try to give students some feedback uh, for not only summative assessment, but definitely uh, formative assessment, let them learn from it and support future learning. Of course, all this come with challenges. Um, first of all, support from the senior management. Do they want that? Or they still want a good old exam? Accreditation from professional bodies. Um, they always have some very stringent rules. Can we change their mindset? Um, and of course, the mindset is not only in the professional body, but also in the society. Um, can we convince people in the society that, well, we don't need the old fashioned exam. We can assess students differently and still make sure students can perform when they come um, as graduates in the society. Of course, all this come with limitation of time and human resources. If you can assess your students one by one, that's great. But if you have 80 students, 150 students, you need a more um, effective way, time-saving way to do the assessment. Um, of course, eventually, I hope there's more genuine adoption and acceptance of outcome-based teaching and learning. So we really assess the outcomes, um, not only make it kind of paperwork. That's kind of my molding here. Anyway, that's all from me. Back to you, Paul. Hey, thank you, very, uh, everyone. I knew it was uh, unreasonable <laughs> to ask you, each of you, uh, to say three to five minutes. Uh, you have so many things to share and you have all got so uh, rich experience. But luckily, uh, we still have uh, eight minutes <laughs> for the Q&A. Uh, of course, I have a number of questions, but uh, I know you well. I can always ask uh, in personal time. Maybe I release the time to the audience. Uh, I would prefer, I, I think uh, it would be, uh, if you like to voice out, uh, you can raise your hand now. Um, We'll uh, give priority to people who like to speak. If not, we'll look at the chat room. Anyone would like to uh, say something, voice out their opinions or questions, uh, raise your hand up so that we can give you the mic. Paul, uh, would you like to address the question by uh, Dr. Daniel Tan? Uh, yes, so in, while we are waiting yeah. for the hands, maybe uh, we we'll look at um, the chat room. Uh, Dr. Tan says, um examination um uh, traditional exam did not work because of the pandemic um a short four so how would you meditate a uh, short four okay yep uh, maybe I, I think it's uh, adjust to question so now uh, we fell short of students' expectations. So what, what do you do? Um, as, I, as my frustration, I believe we are not doing enough. Um, and we spend too much time trying to um, running good old exams online. Um, that, that's what I want to change, but it's definitely not easy. Uh, of course, I mean, that's more difficult at the moment because uh, as Daniel pointed out, we do not have face-to-face -face sessions. So um, we, no matter what kind of assessment, we still need to rely on technology to make it online. Um, frankly, I do not have a very good solution and uh, I, I hope someone has. Um, anyone in the, on the panel? So there are a lot of questions about assessment. So maybe it, uh, Rosemary asks you, 
how about cheating? So students seems to be able to uh, log in from another device. Well, there's always an uh, issue about cheating online. And um, as I mentioned, the senior management did think of lots of uh, ways to avoid that. For example, using a two device proctoring environment. Those things, well, it could work, but then I, I, I feel is we're spending too much time to design all that because uh, we still have to hang on to the good old exam yeah. style assessment. That's something I would like to change. But as I mentioned, uh, efficiency is highly required nowadays when we have so many students. So frankly, I do not have a very good um, suggestion uh, in terms of we maintain the same efficiency, but also make assessment more um, reasonable in, in the time like this. But so I really like the other in the panel to, to respond. <laughs> Anyone has a problem or had any? I guess um, we have to strike a balance between um, moving forward to written assignment, authentic assessments, and uh, assessment that aligns with uh, showing and showcasing students higher order uh, capabilities and competence. At the same time, the university, the teachers and the learners, all of us have to convince the professional bodies like the ACCA, like the IEEE, like the hospital authorities in Hong Kong, they have very rigid uh, professional qualification systems that are contingent upon the traditional conventional systems of examinations. So I don't think is, there is any easy way out, but in the coming few years, we'll see how much change we can uh, leap forward in this direction. Yeah. I, I saw that uh, Nandi and uh, uh, okay. Lee, Mr. Lee as well. They also mentioned in the chat room a lot about uh, using uh, alternative assessments. Do not always stick to the old way. Some use us, yes, yeah, some suggested projects, some suggested written assignment, etc. I think it's re very reasonable. Actually, in Chinese U, we try to do that as well as try to persuade teachers to uh, do open book, for example, or to, to do other writing. Uh, as uh, exam. But a uh, question mentioned earlier that it is not always uh, appropriate. For example, accreditation, they have some very strict uh, rules uh, for how exams should be done, etc. There are a lot of other reasons that why teachers uh, stick to the old way. So any other, so nobody uh, raise hand. So can we will I, look. Can yeah. I uh, add a bit? Uh... Actually, at HKBU, uh, we update, uh, I mean, get um, add an addendum to the assessment policy uh, to make sure that the examination, the waiting for examination is less than 40%. And make sure that um, we have different alternative assessments available for the students um, to assess their learning progress or process instead of the end of semester uh, performance. Uh, like to, to give like formative feedback, the that we, we found the importance of the synergy of the summative and formative assessment. And uh, actually uh, since uh, the beginning of the semester, uh, beginning of the, uh, the year, I mean like last semester, uh, we have majority of the, our colleagues like uh, gave up their, gave up their um, examination and changed to um, open book assignments um, and also uh, some other um, assessment like annotated bibliography, like uh, portfolio, um, some different 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 uh, assessments. And but I think it is more important now for us to rethink um, the code of practices and code of behavior uh, for this new form or alternative assessment because like um, the regulations that, um, that we have usually by the registry is like a more traditional style or old style um, and more uh, related to the final uh, traditional um, in-person in, in examination. So we have to rethink um, the code of practice and code of behavior as well. Right. 
So that's uh, another question also in the chat room, which is still about uh, assessment. Uh, Brandy asks if uh, the course is a digital module distance learning course, how could uh, authentic assessment be possible? Anyone have any suggestions? Quick and dirty one, since uh, yeah. we have reached six o'clock already, maybe a, a example of authentic assessment will uh, be made up of a show and tell, do something, make a product, uh, tell a story, uh, you get a face camera video and then uh, accompany it with a written report. So that might be a quick way out for setting up an authentic assessment related yeah. to the subject content matter. Thank you. Any other quick tips? In-person uh, assessment by Rosemary uh, in the context of low-tech environment. Low-tech environment calls for low-tech solution, right? Mm. If you cannot do synchronous, do asynchronous. Yes. So uh, even using uh, SMS or, or asynchronous discussions that are less technically demanding could work a good way out for you. Right. The, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, it's six already. Uh, and uh, it seems that our questions are still related to the last uh, topic assessment. Uh, while actually we cover a lot of things today, any questions to the other uh, speakers? We may uh, overrun a few minutes, if you don't mind. Well, if I may chip in, I think that's that the, the assessment question, question is an alignment question and is a feedback question and that we have to really think about those. So that's why the very first in our summer sandbox was thinking about that concept of backward mapping. You know, let's look at your course outline. What's your assessment? What are you locked into? Because you don't want to have to go to academic board. You don't have time. What are you locked into in terms of your course outline and how can you be flexible within those, those guidelines? The next step, if we're thinking about moving from just surviving this moment to the transition forward, is how do we do really principled continuous assessment with ongoing feedback and not rely on a final proctored examination? Mm -hmm. um, one alternative, so at Hong Kong U, we did, of course, like everyone else, the Band-Aid, and we came up with an online proctored examination, which got better over time. Um, but as um, Akrosha raised, we're actually not fixing the fundamental problem of why are we over relying on, on final examinations um, and final proctored examinations. One solution put to colleagues was to try, and I've seen it used very nicely, um, is the structured Viva and try one of those online instead of um, a proctored examination. And you actually end up in a cost benefit analysis of staff time versus marking a paper. If you do it all real time, it actually ends up very much the same just like admissions with multiple mini interviews. So, you know, there are ways to think about these things that are, that are time and cost effective. Um, and uh, sometimes it's a matter of approaching our professional bodies and um, offering them our expertise and, um, and advising them too. So those are a few thoughts from me on that. Well, thank you, very interesting idea. Uh, actually, I think the changes needed for in uh, how to assess students it is needed. Uh, the changes are very much needed, despite whether whether there's a pandemic or whether e assessment is coming or not. But the e assessment actually uh, speed up all the uh, all the uh, thinking process. I think. Uh, I would like to briefly address to a question by Humor on how to go by technology uh, integration uh, and going uh, e learning in a new normal for developing countries. My good advice for you is to start with what you have already and do baby step one step at a time. You cannot uh, shoot for things that is out of reach, but you can do the best out of what you have. And maybe asynchronous uh, learning is a way out for most of developing countries. Thank you, Kevin. So uh, by so speaking, I think uh, is about time. Um.